Well, amen. It's a joy to be in the house of the Lord. We thank God for those of you who are here in the room, those who are joining us online as well. We're looking forward to what God is going to do, how he's going to speak and move through this week of revival meetings. And we do want to welcome to our service today, uh, Brother Doug Older, alum of Clear Creek is here. Doug, wave at everybody. Give him a Clear Creek welcome. And then Brother Sam and Tomasa Reisner, they're here as well this morning. Good to see them. I asked Sam uh, a few moments ago if he'd been doing any hunting since he had retired from Clear Creek. And uh, he said Tomasa's kept him too busy catching up on honeydew uh, items at home. And so uh, I, I know that... Uh, there's much to do in that respect. Well, our speaker today is uh, Pastor Mike Stone uh, from Blackshear, Georgia. Pastor's Emanuel Baptist Church. Been there, as I understand, since 1996. Began as the minister of music. And then in 2002, they called him to be uh, their pastor. And so the Lord is blessing and using uh, Pastor Mike and the church there uh, in a great way. He's a graduate of Valdosta State. And we're thankful that he accepted the invitation to come and to be our revival preacher uh, for this week. And so you continue to pray for him and pray for the Lord to speak through him. Well, let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you, God. What a privilege it is to be gathered together, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would be on display today through the songs of worship that we lift up in praise unto your name and through your word that is preached. Father, may you, Lord, just pour out your anointing upon the man of God. May you loose his lips. Father, position your gifting within him. Help him to preach today in the power of your spirit. And God, I pray that we would just sense a move of God in our hearts and in our lives as you fan the flame of revival. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Clear Creek. I ask that if you're able and willing, if you will stand and help us sing. Sacred head 
your burdens being laid down at the feet of God. I just thank you, Lord. So at this time, I'm going to ask that if you're feeling led, if you'll come to the altar, and we're going to take a time just to thank God and to praise him for who he is, not for what he's done, but just who he simply is. So if you feel led, come to the altar, and we're going to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for this morning's uprising and last night's lying down, oh God. God, I thank you for the hand of protection that you have upon us while we're here, oh God. As life is crazy outside of these doors, oh God, you have kept us, God. God, you've kept us in our right mind, oh God, and you gave us freedom to study your word, God, despite the, the cruelty of the world, oh God. So God, I thank you right now, God, for keeping us humble, God. God, although we could be boasting in our sin, which is not a good thing, oh God, I thank you that we can boast in the salvation that Christ has given us, oh God. So God, we bless your name, God, no matter what happens in our life, oh God. God, we always bless your name for who you are, God. And I thank you right now, and I seal this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Heavenly Father God, oh God, your name is great God. You're a mighty God. And God, I thank you for keeping us, God, keeping us in our right mind, God, giving us the word that we need to live daily, oh God, for it's a daily battle, God, to stay right. But by your word, oh God, we can live right, oh God. God, I pray that as the speaker comes in this hour, oh God, that you will give him a tongue of clarification, oh God, and allow us to decrease, God, that you will increase in every aspect of our life, oh God, and give us a renewed heart, a renewed mind, a renewed strength. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. The psalmist said, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. For yes. the Lord our God is a great God, and a great King above all other gods. We do rightly when we sing, How Great is Our God. Thank you to these students and others who helped lead us in worship to our God this morning. We are your debtors, and I am indebted to you, to our president, and to all those who had a part in inviting me to be the speaker for this time together in the Word of God. I want to go ahead and invite you to turn with me in the Old Testament to the book of Nehemiah. In the interest of time, I want to dive right into God's Word together because I'm doing this morning what I do every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock service and especially at the 1030 service. I'm standing between a bunch of Baptists and lunch. And so I want to get right to the heart and literally the meat of the matter as we look in the book of Nehemiah chapter 6, in just a moment we're going to read verses 1 through 4. While you're finding Nehemiah 6, let me again express my great gratitude for the privilege of being here. And I pray that God would not only speak through me, but that God would speak to me. Those of you, whether you're teaching Sunday school, working with a youth ministry, pastoring a church, preaching as an evangelist, working as a professor, in any way that you're teaching or sharing the Word of God, you know that when we share what the Bible calls the Word of God quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, it has the ability to simultaneously convict both the speaker and the hearer, to comfort and encourage, to admonish the one that's talking and those that are listening. And I need to hear the Word of God this morning. So I pray that as God the Holy Ghost would anoint me to preach, that He would give us each the anointing to hear from Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. I want to speak for just a few moments this morning on this subject. Will you say, oh no, to oh no? Will you say, oh no, to oh no? Now, I believe in preaching through books of the Bible. I'll be talking with uh, one of the classes this afternoon on preaching and pastoring. And as we talk about preaching, my commitment is to preach through books of the Bible. And I've recently completed a more than a year-long series going through the combined books of Ezra and Nehemiah, going verse by verse and line by line. And when we came to the sixth chapter, one of the more familiar incidents and encounters from this Old Testament history book, I found here a great word of revival. Because the longer I pastor and the more that I preach, I've discovered that there are at least two different kinds of revival. Now there may be more, but there are at least two kinds of revival that God's people need. Sometimes God's people are living off in what Luke 15 might describe as the pig pen of the world. And we need the man of God to take the word of God with the power of God to kick us in the seat of our spiritual britches and draw us back from apathy and waywardness and backsliddenness and we'll... We'll probably sometime this week have a revival message like that, but the one I want to start with this morning that I think is on the heart of God is the other kind of revival, and that's the kind of revival that a, that a weary person gets from a good night's sleep, or a, or a hungry man gets from a good meal, or a thirsty woman gets from a good, tall, cool glass of water. It's when you're tired and you're tempted to grow weary in well doing. And I want to bring a word of reviving encouragement this morning, presented in the form of a question Will you say, Oh no, to Oh no? I think you'll understand my title as we read the word together. If you're able and willing to do so, I invite you to stand to show your honor for the public reading of what we know to be God's, listen now, His inspired, infallible, inerrant, absolutely authoritative, totally sufficient book. Someone has said when, when the Word of God is read, it's as if God is speaking. I said, no, it's better than that. When the Word of God is read, God is indeed speaking. And here's what he says in Nehemiah 6. Now it came to pass 
when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. I pray God would add a blessing to the reading of His Word as we take our seats this morning. Whether you have a paper, traditional copy of the Word of God or the Bible on your Bible app. I hope that you'll keep either of them open throughout the message because I'm just going to do what expository preachers do. I'm just going to work my way back through the text because I don't have anything to say to you this morning than to expound on what God has said through His perfect Word. Now I'm a little bit older than most of you, but in 1980 I was in the fifth grade when President Ronald Reagan's wife, Nancy Reagan, helped to launch a campaign against illegal drug use. It was so simple. It was so basic. It was so what we call in South Georgia, bottom shelf teaching. She had, as it were, put the cookies on the bottom shelf. You didn't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer or the brightest book in the box to understand what First Lady Nancy Reagan meant when she admonished Americans, when you are tempted or enticed to illegal drug use, just say no. There were many Christian ministries, particularly youth and student ministries, that picked up on that little theme. And when they were talking about the temptation to sexual immorality prior or outside of marriage, they would say, just say no. Well, I don't think that Nancy Reagan came up with that idea, nor did your student minister, because that's good advice whether you're fighting illicit drugs or immoral sexual behavior. Nehemiah uses that same uh, principle to fight a demonic attack against the Word of God. When he is enticed to leave the work of God and go take a little respite in the plain of the village of Ono, Nehemiah says, oh no. Now if you are faithfully trying to serve the Lord, you're going to be tempted. You're going to be enticed. You're going to be discouraged to the point that you'll want to throw in the towel. Call it quits. Give up. Give in. And give over. And I find in these four verses there are three basic principles that will help us to say oh no to the temptation to leave the work of God for the plain of oh no. I hope you'll take a pen, a piece of paper or maybe your notes app on your smart device and jot down these three things. Number one, you have to realize you have an assignment to embrace. You as the child of God have an assignment to embrace. Now, I don't think I have to rehearse for this assembly this morning the historical context of Nehemiah 6. But let me just give you the Cliff's Notes version. Nehemiah was the servant of God and the servant and the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes. He, he was burdened by the report that he had that the city of Jerusalem lay in ruins and that the walls still lay in desolation. And so he sought the hand of God and he sought permission from the king of the Medo-Persian Empire to leave that place of captivity, to go back to the city of Jerusalem and to be used by God to rebuild those walls. I want you to see that when Nehemiah came to the city of Jerusalem to rebuild that that structure, he did indeed come on an assignment from the king. But it wasn't from the king of Persia. He had an assignment from the king of glory, from the king of heaven. He had an assignment from the king of kings. Now that may sound romantic and super spiritual, but if you are a born again child of God, you too have an assignment from the Lord. The only question is, will you embrace that assignment and faithfully 
fulfill it or will you shirk that assignment and leave it undone? Every child of God has an assignment from the Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 9 that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to Christ. I don't want to wrinkle up your theology unless it's wrong. I want to iron it out. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, that to each and every child of God, you've been given a manifestation of the Spirit of God for the profit, for the P-R-O-F-I-T, for the benefit, for the good, for the building up, for the edification of everyone else. That means when you got saved, I don't care if it was in chapel at Clear Creek Bible College, if it was at vacation Bible school when you were a child, kneeling by your bed with your mama or daddy, maybe a Tuesday night in a revival service, maybe riding down the road listening to Adrian Rogers on the radio. When you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Spirit of God came to take up residence in your heart and when He, the Holy Ghost, came, He came bringing and bearing a giftedness, that is, a divine capability for you to do something at, in, and through the local New Testament church. Can I just stop right here and say, I know I'm talking mainly to college students this morning. I beg you by the mercies of God, do not waste four or five or six years of your life thinking that one day when I get out of school, I'm going to be faithful to serve the Lord. No, you've got an assignment to embrace right here and right now. Nehemiah was able to say, oh no, to the temptation to quit because he, he knew he had an assignment to embrace. Now, now, how do we see that fleshed out in his life? Two simple things. Number one, he heard an inspired word. The Bible says that he came to the city of Jerusalem to rebuild these walls. And this was an assignment that he had gotten with an inspired word from the Lord. Now, for you note takers, I'm going to have some verses put up on the screen as we just quickly review the assignment that Nehemiah received. Over and over again, the scripture teaches that this work was the work and the will of God. He had heard a word from the Lord. Back in chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, Nehemiah speaking, and the king granted them to me because the good hand of God was upon me. Chapter 2 verse 12, he said, I did not tell anyone what my God was putting in my mind. Not what I came up with. Not what I wanted to do because I was stirred with citizenship or patriotism, though he was. God had put this in his mind to do. Chapter 2, verse 18, I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable toward me. Hey, if you're going to serve the Lord more than anything else, you need a good education, you need strength, you need some ability, but more than anything else, you need the hand of God on you. Chapter 2, verse 20, I answered them and said, the God of heaven will give us success. In chapter 4, verse 15, when the enemies first came to thwart the work, the Bible says, when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each to his work. Nehemiah had heard a word from God this is what I've told you to do and this is where I've told you to do it. Now I want you to look right here and pay very close attention. As you, many of you at a stage in your life that you're seeking and trying to discern the will of God, one of the benefits of hearing this assignment from the Lord is the gift of discernment. The ability to say no to the things you need to say no to. For example, the Bible says at the end of verse 2, but they thought to do me mischief. Nehemiah tells us about this, this trio of enemies, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, and they come, and I believe that their words were probably dripping with sweetness and sugared up with honey. Nehemiah, come, let's take a little break. Just a little respite over here in one of the villages of the plain of Oh No. But Nehemiah said, I knew they intended to do me mischief. Now don't answer out loud because I don't want you to give the wrong answer. How did he know that? How did he know that they were up to no good? 
How did Nehemiah know that probably right outside the city limits of Jerusalem there was, there was an ambush waiting on him to take his very life? How did he know that? We could generally say discernment, but how did he discern that? I want to give you just a real practical answer. He knew God had told him to be here working on this wall. And if God told me to be here doing this, then the invitation to go over there and do that is not the will of God for my life. I don't care where there is or what that is. If God told me to be here doing this, then anywhere else and anything else is not the will of God. Notice this statement, nothing will help you say no to the devil's plan like saying yes to the will of God. Several years ago, I received a phone call from a very prominent church in the Southern Baptist Convention. And that's not bragging, but you got to understand it was a big, impressive church. Lots of people, lots of attention, lots of prominence. And they, the, the chairman of this pulpit committee asked, would I talk to them about maybe coming to be their pastor? But it had only been about a week and a half, two weeks that I had finished praying through a similar call for another church and God had confirmed in my soul about 10 to 14 days prior to that phone call that He wanted me to stay at the church where I was at. And so I said to that man, I, I've just finished up a season of prayer. God wants me to stay where I am. And he said, brother, could I take a few minutes and tell you about our church and some of the things going on at our church? And I said, brother... I know enough about your church to know that if I stay on this phone call in the next few weeks, I'm going to be meeting with some people and meeting at hotel conference rooms in the back room at the Cracker Barrel, talking to people I don't have any business talking to and I'm going to find myself out of the will of God. God has told me to be here doing this and that means I can't be anywhere else doing anything else, listen to me now, with anybody else and be in the will of God. Nothing will help you say no to the attack of the devil like saying yes to the things of God. Can I give you a more practical illustration? On July the 15th, 1995, I stood at a marriage altar and I said yes to God and yes to Andrea Barnes, now Andrea Barnes Stone. Over 26 years ago, I said yes to that one woman. That means I've got to say no to every other woman. Are you still in this sermon with me? I said yes to her. That means no to everybody else. I don't care if her daddy owns the mill. I don't care if she's got a big house. I don't care if she's built. Like what the Commodores used to call a brick house. It doesn't matter what she looks like, how much money she's got, how she scratches my itch, floats my boat, or rings my bell. I said yes over here. That means no to anything else. Are you serving where God told you to serve, then what are you griping about? What are you spending all your time looking somewhere else for? P bloom where you're planted. Serve God where you are. Get a word from God and don't, don't, don't quit. Nehemiah had an assignment to embrace. He heard an inspired word. But secondly, he had an important work. Notice what he says in verse 3. I said, I'm doing... A great work. Now you Bible students ought to get out your Strong's Concordance or use your online resources. You'll find that word great. He said, I'm doing, a, I'm doing a great work. It's a real interesting word. Sometimes that word great could describe the, the size or the, the, the scope or the scale of the work. Like it was a really big work of God. But in this context, the word seems to indicate not the size of it, but the nature of it. It's not how big it is that makes it great. It's what it is that makes it great. More importantly, who it's for. The church where you serve, does your Sunday school class have two or three students in it, if you're teaching the Word of God, that's a great work. 
It doesn't matter how big it is. Even the smallest thing done for the glory of a big God is a great work. Could there be a discouraged professor or administrator in this room today? If you're serving a great God, we sang about it a few moments ago, how great is our God? And therefore, how great is anything done for that great God? Nehemiah says, I am doing a great work. And I remind you that Nehemiah didn't really have any ultimate way to know how greatly God was going to use his work. I want you to put your gospel glasses on for just a moment. All good preaching tries somewhere to make a beeline for the cross. All good preaching is ultimately Jesus-centered. All faithful ministry is ultimately dripping with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nehemiah said, I'm doing a great work, and yet he didn't have any way of knowing how great his work was going to be. Because the Spirit of God gives us a little sort of an editorial footnote. It's a construction timeline footnote at the end of verse 1. He says that there was no breach in the wall, Though at that time I'd not set up the doors upon the gates. In other words, the wall is finished and he's doing the final details. He's about to hang some gates. He's about to hang some doors and gates on the wall. He doesn't have any way of knowing how God is going to use those gates. How God is going to use those doors. How God is going to use those walls. We're just a few centuries away. That's that's a puff of smoke in the scope of eternity. In this text, we're a few centuries away from the hushed cry of an infant lying in a manger in the tiny little hamlet of Bethlehem. He will live in perfection. He will walk for 33 and a half years with never a wicked thought, never an evil deed, never a sinful word. And on the Sunday before Passover, most likely in the year of our Lord around 28 or 29, these gates will swing open. These doors will open. And riding through these gates, not yet even finished, on a donkey's colt upon whom no man had ever set, comes the virgin-born, sinlessly living Son of the Most High God. He will ride into this rebuilt city amidst the shouts of Hosanna. Glory to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as they lay their palm branches and their coats down before him. He will go up to this newly rebuilt temple and and he will, by the end of the week, he will be taken outside these walls through these gates where he will give his life on a blood spattered skull shaped mountain but hang around for three days more as he kicks death in the mouth and gets up from the dead with the keys of death, hell and the grave, the key to your salvation in his very hand. Nehemiah says, I'm doing a great work and could I just tell you, nothing will make it a greater work than if you'll see how God is using the little thing that you're doing to connect to the big, bold, grand plan of Jesus Christ redeeming sinful mankind from their sin. That's when you'll see, I'm not just teaching two little boys in Sunday school. I'm being used to build the kingdom of God and bring glory to Christ. I'm not filling in at some podunk church on the back side of nowhere. I'm preaching the word of God to the glory of Jesus. God is using me to do a great work to build the kingdom of God. If you're doing something for Christ, it is a great work. Nehemiah knew he had an assignment to embrace. There's a second thing, however, we find in this text that will help you say, oh no, to oh no. Could you stand a second one? I hope so, because I got this one and one more. You have an assignment to embrace. You have an adversary to engage. Hey, look right here and listen to me. One of the occupational hazards of serving Jesus is opposition. It may come from a deacon. It may come from a WMU director. 
It may come from a church member. It may come from a politician trying to close the doors of your church. It may come from under your own roof, from somebody that bears your last name. But there will be opposition to the things of God. Now they come and they say, come let us meet in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Now you need to know that Ono was a seaside region. It was an area near what we would call the beach. A place of rest, recreation and relaxation. How subtle, scheming, seductive this opposition was. When will opposition come? I want to give you two answers and we see indication of them right here in this text. Pastor Mike, when can I expect the adversary to oppose me? Well, first of all, he'll come in times of success when things are going well. Nehemiah is on the verge of completion. He tells us in this text that the walls have been completed The gates and the doors are being finished. By the end of the chapter, the entire 52-day wonder-filled project will be completed. In our day, we would say, if you've ever built a house or been involved in construction, we would say they're, they're going through the punch list. They're finishing up trimming the baseboard. They're screwing on the doorknobs. They're installing the last of the plumbing fixtures. I mean, the end is in sight. Things are going well. In my ministry, I've come today to testify to you, you are never more ripe, never more of a sitting duck for the devil to attack you than when you least expect it. When things are going well. You young marrieds need to listen to the preacher this morning. Your marriage is never more susceptible than when you let down your guard and you think our marriage is strong, our our relationship is great. We don't have to read the Word together anymore. We don't have to pray together anymore. And you'll discover that an unguarded strength is a double weakness. Opposition came in times of success. Now if you don't think the devil will try to attack you when everything is going well, just ask Moses. I mean, God had used him to lead Israel out of Egyptian bondage. They've crossed the Red Sea. He's been up at the top of Mount Sinai. Face is glowing with the Shekinah glory of God. And the whole time his associate pastor is down in the valley teaching the people how to build a golden calf. Now, if you don't think God will, that that, that Satan will come against you when things are going well, just ask Elijah. Confronted the prophets of Baal up at the top of Mount Carmel, literally called fire down from heaven and within days he's running for his life from Queen Jezebel finds himself under a juniper tree asking God to take his life now I've often thought if he wanted to be killed he could have stayed back at the top of Mount Carmel and Jezebel would have taken care of that for him Satan comes to attack the plan of God in times of success If this week during a time of revival, if by God's grace this morning, you set your jaw, draw a line in the sand, square your shoulders, bow your back, and say, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. That I'm going to turn from that sin. I'm going to renew my commitment. I'm going to renew my faithfulness to Christ and His work. Listen to the preacher this morning. The devil will not take that sitting down. Expect opposition in times of success. But notice the opposition also comes in times of struggle. In times of success and in times of struggle. You say, isn't that Sort of contradictory, Brother Mike. No, it just means that you should expect an attack all the time. When things are going well and when things are going bad. Now the project is nearing completion. It's successful in that regard. But if you know your Bible, this 52-day project has been moving at a breakneck pace. And in the previous chapter, you ought to go back and study Nehemiah chapter 5. There had been a family squabble in the previous text. That's how we know they were ancient Baptists. They were all mad at each other. Baptists can always find something to be upset about. I saw a cartoon recently that was two old ladies on the phone and they were dressed 
Obviously, they'd come from church, and one old lady was talking to the other one. She said, Mabel, it's awful. They're printing new songs in the hymnal. They're projecting old songs on the screen. I can't even remember anymore which songs I'm supposed to be mad about. Now the people who are laughing are the ones who serve faithfully in the local church. They know what I'm talking about. Here's Nehemiah in chapter 6 with with a brick in one hand and a bunch of backslidden angry Baptists on the other. How easy it would have been to throw in the towel for those of you going into vocational ministry. Let me just give you a practical word of advice. Write your resignation every Monday morning then put it in the shredder and forget about it. Don't give in to the attack of the enemy in times of struggle. Nehemiah is facing a very difficult time. But I've been pastoring long enough to know that churches and marriages and ministries, they go through seasons. They go through ups and they go through downs. You see, ministry like people. You got good days and you've got bad days. 25 years next month in the same church and I've seen seasons where it seemed like it seemed like I could almost read the back of the phone book and the altars would be filled, people giving their hearts to Christ. I know that theologically that can't happen. I'm saying that figuratively, of course. But Brother Josh, there have been other seasons I feel like we could have raised Adrian Rogers from the dead to preach his best sermon and you couldn't even get a little boy to get up and move to go to the bathroom. (laughs) Nothing happening. You look right here and listen to me. The only standard by which you measure success in the family of God is obedience. Not do you have more money than you had last month. Do you have more people than you had last week? Not do you have more baptisms this year than last year? Although all of those things are wonderful things we ought to pay attention to. The only standard of measuring success as a Christian is have you been obedient to Christ? Because opposition is going to come when times are good and when times are are bad. How can I say oh no to oh no? Well, number one, you've got an assignment to embrace. Number two, you've got an adversary to engage. Number three, you have an accounting to expect. One of the lost doctrines that I find in the church today, and I preach in a lot of different places, is the doctrine of the judgment of the saint. The Bible teaches that there will be several judgments. Generally, we'll say today, for today's purposes, two judgments. Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15 speaks of the judgment of the lost. We call that the great white throne judgment. But the Bible says throughout the New Testament that those who are redeemed will still stand and give an account for our life. Not to determine whether we are saved, that's settled at the cross. But to be evaluated, examined, hey, scrutinized and rewarded for our service to Christ. You note takers may jot down 1 Corinthians 10 verses 11 through 15. Speaks of the process of that judgment. 2 Corinthians 5.10 puts it this way, For we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ to be recompensed, that means to be paid back for the deeds done in the flesh, whether they be good or bad. Romans 14.12 says, So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. What should we expect to be examined when we face that accounting? The reason I want to show you a couple of things in the life of Nehemiah is because of this. I'm just going to confess something for just a moment. When I look back over much of my life, much of my ministry, and even much of my pastorate, we spend an awful lot of time on stuff that isn't going to matter a hill of beans. It's not going to matter. 
my wife and I and each of our four children actually are avid deer hunters. Archery season opened in Georgia just this past Saturday. We're getting ready for rifle season that, that opens up on October the 16th. And we've got deer mounts all over our house. We've got, my, my office is in deer mounts. We, we love to deer hunt. I was visiting last week with a member of our church who was struggling with cancer. He actually went to be with the Lord early yesterday morning. Having visited a number of times with them, there's this massive deer mount on his wall. It's the kind, for those of you who deer hunt, when I asked him, where did you shoot that? I knew he was going to say Texas or Iowa or Kansas, some great place like that. And he, he pointed back to the tree line on the edge of a field there by his farm. He said, I shot it right back here. When I went to leave last week, he commented that I've always, that I like that deer. He said, Preacher, take that deer if you want it. Means nothing to me. If you know anything about deer hunting, there was a time that he had cameras all up over the back edge of that field. Pouring corn everywhere. We can do that legally down in Georgia, by the way. <laughs> Getting up at 4.30 in the morning, spraying himself down with the urine of a barnyard animal. Climbing up a pine tree with a Gatorade bottle for a bathroom. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich for lunch. Staying up there from before sunrise till after sunset. But there's something about death puts things in perspective. Take it if you want it. Doesn't mean anything to me. I want to admonish you as we close this morning to live with eternity in mind. There are a couple of things that I see pictured in these four verses that we will give an account for at the judgment. The first is what I would simply label the completion of the work. The completion of the work. Verse 3, And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease? Now this is one reason I think the Holy Spirit gave us that little construction footnote at the beginning of the chapter. They're almost done. Brothers and sisters, he could have handed this job over to any number of his assistants. We're almost done. We're, the finish line is in sight. Take over, finish this job. I've got a meeting that I've got to go to. But he said, God did not call me here, listen now, to start something. God called me here to finish something. Anybody can start a race. If you gave out prizes for starting races, we'd have President Romney. Anybody can sign up for a marathon. Takes a lot of training and work to finish one. I know Baptist churches best. Anybody can stop by the Welcome Center and sign up to go on a mission trip. Sign up to drive a bus and pick up kids for church. Sign up to teach Sunday school. Anybody can sit in a revival service and with heads bowed and eyes closed, raise a hand and say, yes, I'm all in. But oftentimes the raising of our hand isn't worth the paper that it's written on. Anybody can start something May God raise up a generation who will say with the Apostle Paul at the hour of death, I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course and I've kept the faith. Sometimes when we preachers preach funerals, we'll say this dear brother, this dear sister has finished their race. Sometimes that's not true. They didn't finish their race. They died in the middle of it. Because they started something but they weren't willing 
to see it through and to finish. Some years ago, we hired a new music minister at our church and one of his first responsibilities was to get someone, presumably a lady in our church, it had typically been ladies that would oversee our various children's choirs. We have three or four children's choirs in our church. We needed a children's choir coordinator. He came to staff meeting one day, this brand new music guy, hadn't been in our church maybe two or three weeks. He came in, oh, wonderful news. I've enlisted a children's choir coordinator. We're about to sing the doxology. Hallelujah. Who is it? And when he gave a name, we're all like, oh, my stars. (laughs) Who's going to tell him? Who's going to tell me what? Who's going to tell you that that girl that you signed up Young adult lady, about the age of some of you in this room today. She don't come but about twice a year. And every time she comes, she's going to sell out and go be a missionary to the African jungle. She's going to go be a missionary down on the Amazon. She's selling out her life, going to be a a full-time women's ministry director. Going to sell out. God's called her to be a preacher's wife. God's called her to do this. God's called her to do that. And won't be back for the evening service if the braves go into extra innings. I'm saying anybody... Anybody can start something. Nehemiah said, God didn't call me here to start something. God called me here to finish a work. Is that not what the Lord Jesus Himself said down by Jacob's well when He spoke to that Samaritan woman? His disciples, they'd been in town, probably went to Chick-fil-A, got some of God's chicken, brought back some of those waffle fries. They said, they said, Jesus, you want some lunch? And he said, I, I've already eaten. Now I'm paraphrasing, but this is what the story means. He, he said, I've already eaten. They said, who brought him some chicken minis? And he says in John 4, my meat is to do the will of the Father and to finish His work. Now if you know your Bible, that's not the last time John we'll use a form of that word teleo and put it in the mouth of the Lord Jesus. For in John chapter 19 and verse 30, just before breathing His last, our Lord with His arms stretched out on Calvary's cross said to Telestai, it is finished. I've done all of it. I've accomplished all of it. Not paid in part, paid in full. I've done everything, Father, that you have sent me to this world to do. And I just want to stop by for a moment today and say, if he came that far to finish a work for me, then I want to live my life and finish a work for him. You and I will be evaluated on the completion of the work. Finally, we'll be evaluated on our commitment to the work. The completion of the work, the commitment to the work. Verse 3 again, I sent messengers unto them. And by the way, verse 4 just says that winning this battle one time won't be enough. That The enemy keeps coming. and He's got to answer the same way every time. But in the middle of verse 3, he says, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Now we believe, and I know this school believes, in what is called the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. Plenary, of course, means we believe it all. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Verbal means that we we don't just believe the Bible is God's Word on the whole. The the concepts, the themes, the idea. No, No, we believe that every individual part of every individual letter, of every individual word, of every verse, of every chapter, of every book, of all 66 books of the Bible, all of it is perfectly given by inspiration of God. I point that out to say that Nehemiah could have said, I'm doing a great work and I will not come down. That would have been a good testimony. Wouldn't have been anything wrong with that, but that's not what he said. He could have said, I'm doing a great work and I'm I ought not come down. That'd be a a great statement of devotion, but that's not what he said. Under divine inspiration, the word here speaks of an incapacity, an inability. 
and therefore an impossibility. I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. I'd say it like this to my church in South Georgia. After all Jesus has done for me, left heaven and came to this world, lived in perfection, died in agony, rose in glory. And after all that I've done to Him, wicked thoughts, evil actions, sinful, mean-spirited words, That's just the stuff that I've done that I ought not to have done. That doesn't even count the stuff that I didn't do that I should have done. That He would forgive me, wash my sin away, give me the promise of heaven, reconcile me to the Father. After all I've done to Him and all He's done for me, I cannot turn my back on my commitment to the Lord. One of the most fascinating stories I've ever heard comes from the world of high school athletics. It was 2010. A young lady by the name of Holland Reynolds. You can Google this and and find this story in places like the New York Times and, and others. Holland was a standout track and field star for her high school. And as the season began, their coach announced that he'd been diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And because of that, that would be his final season as their coach. So the girls got together and did what you might expect they would do. They said, we're going to redouble our efforts. Let's go for the state title. We want to send coach out with a state championship. And that's exactly what they set out to do. And the story is told that they come down to the the, the final event of that year. They're leading in all the state numbers. All they have to do is finish that last race. As long as they finish and are not disqualified, they're going to be the state champs. And Holland Reynolds is running the last leg of that multi-runner event. She was expected to win. So everybody was surprised when runner after runner after runner after runner after runner crosses the finish line and Holland is not in sight. After what seemed like a long period of time, They see on the horizon coming around the corner this young lady, Holland School uniform. It's her and she's she's limping, she's struggling. If you know anything about running, she's got this strange gait to her her step. But they can tell that she's in trouble. They they, they rush over to the side of the running area and she's waving them off. She's telling them that she wants wants to finish. According to the New York Times, she collapsed two yards, six feet away from the finish line, waving off all of the medics and everyone, telling them that she wants to finish. And she took 20 seconds to crawl the last six feet. And she crossed the finish line. They finished last in that event, of course, but they won the state title nonetheless. And all the local media were there. And one reporter asked her what she was thinking about with all that pain that was in her body. She said, I didn't feel any pain at all. All I could think about was my coach on the other side of that finish line. And I wanted to finish. And I've come this morning just to simply say, your heavenly coach is on the other side of life's finish line. Whatever would entice you to quit, keep on singing, keep on serving, Keep on praying. Keep on soul winning. Keep on teaching that kid's class. Keep on being a faithful husband, a godly wife. Keep on following the Lord. May our commitment today be that of the old hymn writer who simply said, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Why? I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed just to remove distraction. I'm going to pray and we're going to be dismissed to lunch and our afternoon activities. But has the Spirit of God put His finger on any issue in your life? 
Is there a renewed commitment you need to make to our Lord this morning? That's what real revival is about. God's people renewing commitment and devotion to the Master. Father in heaven, by the power of the Spirit, would you oversee and superintend the response to this message? We ask you by your grace to confront us in our sin, encourage us in our discouragement, strengthen us in our weakness, that our lives may ultimately resound to the great glory of Jesus Christ, to whom all glory ultimately belongs. And we make our humble prayer this morning in the blessed name of Jesus, our Lord. And the people of God all said, Amen. Amen. God bless you.